Good evening. Welcome to the January 25th, ed both Education and Pupil Services and Finance and Operations Committee meetings in person and virtual. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we call tonight's meeting to order, Dr. McGarry, will you please outline the public's participation procedures, please? Uh, yes, Board President Brown. Um, can everybody in here hear me? I, the, it's hard with the, the mask. Thank you. Um, obviously, we have uh, back to in-person participation in committee meetings and board meetings. Uh, anyone attending in person will obviously be able to come up to the microphone, state their name and address, um, and be able to, at the comment period or questioning period, address anything that's on the agenda this evening and the uh, board will direct the administration uh, to answer any questions uh, this evening. Tonight at committee meetings, we do answer questions. So we'll be taking in-person questions and comments first. Again, please come to the microphone, provide your name, address, and the specific report that you'd like to, uh, agenda item you'd like to comment on or ask questions and we will provide our best answers. We also are continuing to allow participation via uh, virtual uh, participation by the community. Um, two ways to provide your comments or questions to the board. One could be by phone, 610-789-7200, extension 2000. Please provide your name, address, and the specific uh, agenda item you'd like to comment on or question. Same for the in-person folks, and we will provide our best questions. You can also send an email in to committee questions at uppertrvsd.org. Same process, please provide your name and address and identify the specific agenda item and uh, send in your question and we'll do our best to make sure that we address that before the board moves forward at the close of each uh, committee agenda this evening. Happy to provide any reports uh, or updates on the reports if we need to. Uh, people that are in person obviously have a right to go first and we'll take uh, virtual comments next. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. The meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee will please come to order. Roll call, Board Secretary, Mr. Rogers, please. Dr. Haig? Present. Mr. Desnoyers? Present. Mr. Neal? Mr. Warsavage? Present. Ms. Lamar Murphy? Present. Ms. Williams? Present. Ms. Mitchell? Present. Mr. Fields? I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Brown? Present. Thank you, sir. The districts posted this evening's agenda to board docs at least 24 hours prior to the commencement of this meeting. Is there a motion to approve that previously posted agenda? So, so moved. Move. Second. Thank you. The agenda has been moved and seconded. Are there any amendments to offer? There are no amendments. Thank you. The, the agenda has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carried. I will now turn over the Finance and Operations Committee meeting to code to my co-chair, Mr. War Savage. Thank you, President Brown. Mr. Rogers, please begin with an overview of your agenda items for this evening. Thank you. Tonight we have three agenda items. Uh, number one is a report on the annual water testing, which is informational. We provide an update on the results of the water test testing each year uh, regard, in regards to copper and lead. Uh, Mr. Lee will provide that presentation tonight. Number two is a request to name a school district facility update uh, following up on our previous presentation. Uh, this will be board action. Uh, I will present the cost analysis associated with the two requests that we've received and uh, go through the process in accordance with the board policy. Uh, number three is also board action is policy. We have three policies up tonight. 610 purchases subject to bid and quotation. 611 purchases budgeted. And 626 federal fiscal compliance. Thank you very much. You may proceed with agenda item number one. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Marvin Lee from the Business Office. Um, this evening, the Business Office will um, talk about the update on the annual water testing results. 
Why are we testing the annual water testing and how do we do it? The purpose of the water testing is to prevent exposure to the lead contamination in the drinking water in our schools. And the water testing requirements are governed by Act 39 of 2018. The annual water testing is not mandated, but it is encouraged. If a school district opt out of performing the annual water testing, the district is obligated to hold a public meeting to discuss the issue. How do we perform it? We collect water samples from five locations in each of our 14 schools, so total 70 locations in the school district. Five locations are school kitchen, nurse's office, first floor water fountain, second floor water fountain, and the, the one more time at the same first floor water fountain. Once the water samples are collected, we take the samples to Aqua Water Lab for independent testing. Um, the water samples are collected and taken to Aqua Lab in December of 2021. Before I discuss the results of latest water testing results, I would like to briefly talk about what we have done over the last couple of years to limit the exposure of lead contamination to our school community. In 2020, school district installed 46 touchless bottle fill hydration station on each floor of our schools. And after last year's, year's uh, water testing report out, we posted two different signs at the nurse's office and in the kitchen. The sign in the nurse's office reads, for drinking water, please use bottle fill water fountain available in the hallway. The intent of this sign at the nurse's office to guide students to take medication using the water from the touchless hydration station. We also posted a sign in the kitchen. The sign in the kitchen reads, run water for between 30 to 120 seconds before using water for cooking. The intent of this sign is to flush out any lead in the water before using the water for cooking. Um, some are major financial investments, some are simple signs, but Tim and um, facilities management team wants to minimize the exposure, any exposure to lead contamination to our students. We'll now talk about this year's, this year's result. The EPA threshold for lead is 0.015 milligram per liter, and the EPA threshold for copper is 1.3 milligram per liter. We're happy to report that none of the reading came above the EPA threshold. In fact, we did not have any lead detected in any of our water samples, and the copper was detected in almost every water sample we provided to Aqua. The actual water results, the test results are available in the board doc for your review. How about the annual trends? What are we seeing? Um, you're looking at the three-year trend of lead and copper level in the drinking water in our schools. I would like to say uh, the, the most important takeaway point from this chart is none of the test results came above the EPA threshold. Uh, do you see the zeros in the red section? Uh, we definitely want to keep it that way in our schools. How about the coppers? The one last thing. Uh, how about the coppers in the drinking water? Uh, we have detected coppers in almost every water sample that we've tested. Is it okay to have copper in the drinking water? It is actually pretty understandable that we, have we are detecting coppers from our water samples because all district's water lines are made out of copper. Uh, here's a study that I found from Washington State Health Department. A part of the report reads, a small amount of copper is essential for good health the Food and Drug Administration recommends a dietary allowance of two milligram of copper a day. So the takeaway from this uh, takeaway point from this study is that although we are detecting a small amount of copper in the drinking water in our schools, the copper levels are below the EPA threshold level and the, district had, the school district has no reason to believe it poses a threat to our students' health. In other words, we do not see any major issues with small amount of copper in the drinking water. This concludes my presentation, and I'll, happy to, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee. Uh, before we pass it around to the rest of the board, I did have a quick question uh, for, for my clarification. Uh, does the quality of the copper pipes or whatever, whatever facility that is that's transmitting the water, does the quality of that matter when it comes to some of that copper leading into the water that we drink? And would that lead to perhaps an opportunity to explore what it looks like? I'm not sure if we've brought this up in so many words before, but perhaps upgrading some of that infrastructure to improve the water quality. Um, in terms of the copper quality, when, whenever that, um, whether that makes any kind of difference in the water quality, I do not know the answer, but I can definitely explore that options and get back to you on that. Yeah. Any other questions from the board, Mr. President? 
Thank you, Marvin. Um, question, uh, and this is obviously an improvement. Every time you do this presentation, it gets better because I don't remember a time when we didn't have any lead. You said zero lead this time. So uh, the only thing you can do better next time is a perfect score on both sides. But for the copper, um, I know you said all of the items detected were below the threshold of 1.3. Yes. Can you give me an idea of what it was? Was it 1.25? Was it zero? Just, I just want to, I'm just curious to know if it was close to the number or. All right, so I can read maybe like a first top 10 reports. Just from one. The report. just, just one. Like two. I would say like a 1 point, point, point 0.1 to maybe 0.5. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's what I usually see in the reports. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. Any other questions from board members? Seeing none, agenda item number two, please. And Mr. Brown, as far as the copper, <clears throat> just looking at the report quickly, the majority were under 0.5. There are a couple that went above 0.5, but they were all below one, okay. um, and the majority below 0.5 or even a, a third, 0.33. Okay. Thank you. So the next presentation is the request to name a school district facility. So as we previously presented after we received the uh, two requests, we went through policy 701.1, naming school district facilities. Uh, at this point, we're really at step five, where the board comes back, or the administration comes back to the board with a cost analysis on what it would take to implement the naming of the facility. At this point, after our or after our previous meeting, we had discussed the two requests, one being the Harry Dietzler Performing Arts Center, the other being the Benglian Performing Arts Center. Uh, during that meeting, the board actually asked the administration to go back to the two individuals who made the requests and ask if they'd be willing to combine the requests. Uh, one wanted to stand firm with their uh, current request. Uh, a second request actually submitted the revised request to rename the facility the Bengley and Dietzler Performing Arts Center. Uh, so that's what we have before the board tonight. Um, and then we can go directly into, there's really options uh, as we see it as an administration of actually naming the facility versus uh, having a, a plaque honoring the career of our two uh, individuals before us tonight. Uh, so in either case, it's likely not going to cost the, more than $2,000 is our assessment because you really have to start getting down to the details of a true design, um, you know, and, and once the board has made a decision on how we move forward, we'll, we'll go there, but we're not, in all of our experience and what we've had in pricing out and working with different companies, we believe it to be no more than $2,000. Um, there was, we, we explored the idea of outside of the Performing Arts Center, there is raised lettering uh, that clearly shows uh, signage outside. Uh, we we were concerned that the exterior signage from a township perspective, there's different uh, permitting requirements and ordinances that only allow for a certain square footage of signage. Uh, they w would likely have been willing to allow us to add metal signing above where it states, where it has Performing Arts Center now. The concern from the administration side is adding that signage and not having it match. It's a, it, it has been there for uh, some time. Uh, the alternative would have been ripping down what exists and putting up a brand new sign. At that point, you really are introducing a new signage to, to the district. Uh, so we started to try and creatively think about what are our other opportunities. Uh, one of the opportunities is the main entrance coming off the lobby into the Performing Arts Center and being able to put a sign uh, above, uh, you know, that could potentially look something like this. Uh, you know, this wouldn't be final designs, quite frankly. I, you know, we identify the area. Um, you know, and I mock this up just to give some type of visual for uh, the board and the public. Uh, but that, that is one option if you are going to rename the Performing Arts Center after, uh, the, either the Dietzler Performing Arts Center or the Bengali and Dietzler uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, the second option where we thought if the, if the board wanted to go in a different direction and still honor the storied careers of both of these individuals, they could put up plaques in the lobby. Uh, we obviously have amp some wall space in there that we could really uh, have a nice plaque created, you know, in both cases where, you know, maybe it states in honor of Barbara Beglin, in honor of Harry Dietzler, you know, with a picture and a statement really 
memorializing all of what they've done here uh, in the district on both front. Uh, at that point, that kind of that gives the board an option of, uh, you know, instead of going full in on name, renaming a facility, keep it as the Performing Arts Center and have, you know, plaques in honor of, of each of them. Uh, but in both cases, we don't see the, the cost exceeding $2,000. In this case, it would be 2000 for both plaques, um, meaning less than 1000 per per plaque with creation. It, it all comes down to one of the more um, interesting pieces that they charge by by word. So depending on how big the description is, um, you know, we don't foresee it going above 1000 for either plaque. Um, so that really brings us to the next step in the policy. At, at this point, the board can have a discussion on how they would like to move forward uh, with either option or you know, maybe some combination, depending on how the board uh, wants to proceed. Uh, we would need two members of the committee to support the change. If we have two members supporting it, you would give me the directive of which option. And, and in the case of uh, a, a plaque in honor of them, it's not your, you would be choosing not to name the facility and, and we could just move forward with creating the plaques um, and we could you know, work through that process. But if the board chooses, if two board members would like to move it forward for renaming of the facility, um, we would move it to the next board meeting. What I would have to do there, the policy states that I have to advertise the intent of the board to rename the facility for 14 days. 14 days puts us past the February board meeting, so in all likelihood, the, you know, the earliest the board could officially vote on this would be at the March uh, board meeting. So I just want to lay that out because we don't have 14 days to advertise before the February meeting. And at this point, I, I would turn it over to the board for, for discussion. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, does anyone on the board have any questions? Mr. President. Yep. Um, so I know uh, one of the parties, I believe it was Director Mitchell, she, she was willing to revise her um, recommendation, you know, in the spirit of honoring both of the worthy candidates that we're trying to honor. Um, and I know the other uh, person, I can't remember who it was, but they did not want to do that. Has a, the idea of a plaque been mentioned to them? Because um, again, I think she, they, I think they wanted to keep um, whatever the dedication is, keep it separate and, you know, like have him stand alone. Um, so would that plaque, would that be acceptable to them? I'm just trying to make sure we um, not appease them, but honor the intent of them making a recommendation at all. So in both cases, the, the policy was followed for specifically renaming the facility. So I, I did not circle back to say that I was going to bring forward an option. Okay. The reason why I brought forward the option is I, I think during the last committee meeting and the presentation, there was a lot of conversation about are there any other ways to honor them. Um, so I didn't want to come forward and to the board and the public and say, you know, the only way to honor either of these individuals is by naming the facility. There's other cases throughout the district where, where you know, we have plaques, we have, you know, a, a wall of fame, we have um, different options. So I wanted to make sure that the board had in front of them, you know, if you, if you want to go down the path of naming the facility, we're following the policy, this is how we'll proceed. Uh, if you chose that, you know, maybe this is a better way to honor these two individuals individually in two uh, honoring plaques, uh, I just wanted that option to be there, but no, I did not circle back with either uh, making their request. Uh, and depending on how the board makes their decision late, if, if need be, I, I can do that. Mr. Disnoyers. Thank you, Director Warsavage. Um, so uh, if the board would like to think about the possibility of naming the facility and one or two plaques, would a uh, ballpark estimate cost be you know four thousand if both names are used and three thousand if one name is used so rough estimate on the on either plaque would be a thousand dollars per plaque uh you know quite frankly the, the company we had reached out to they have most plaques come in under a thousand the breakdown of projected what it, what the uh cost per word of uh, some of the things we've experienced in the past is roughly seven hundred and fifty dollars we want to make sure we account for potential buffer on, on the, the wording and installation. 
I, I would say roughly if you wanted to go down the path of naming the facility and in addition installing both plaques, you're looking at, I would imagine, no more than $4,000 when you, you add the two together. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Just back to my statement. I, I would think I would want to know, I mean, that, that would maybe influence how I vote if I, if the person who didn't want the dual um, acknowledgement, I would want to know how they felt about the plaque because that way we could do something that honors um, everyone's desires, um, you know, to have them recognized in the way that they see fit. So I would probably want to know that. Um, that's probably a quick answer to get, but um, that's just my thoughts. Just a point of clarification for myself, Mr. Rogers, would it be correct if, for parliamentary parlance sake, the decision that the board is about to make would be specifically for the renaming of the facility and then we could make considerations of whatever the plaques to President Brown's point wanting to make sure that we honor the, the requests appropriately. Um, would that, is that a correct assumption? Yes, tonight the real decision has to be whether or not there are two board members supporting the renaming of the facility based on following board policy. Um, and again, that would, wouldn't go before the board for a vote until March. So that's a, a decent uh, amount of time to be able to get the answers to the questions that uh, President Brown are, are seeking. Dr. McGarry? I believe Mr. Fields has a comment or a question, and then I'd like to follow up if it's okay after that. Thank you, Director Warsavers. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, I just want to, I like the plaques. Uh, I like the, pla the plaques. Um, I think, uh, I think, right, I, if I'm hearing the administration correctly, if I'm hearing uh, Mr. Rogers correctly, uh, our choices are, well, we should decide, do we want to rename the building or provide the plaques? I know there, there may be an urge to do the renaming and the plaques. Um, I, 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 I guess I think that's a lot. Not that it's not deserved, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, beyond what's being requested. Um, but I do appreciate uh, the plaques being presented as 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 an option in in the lobby, over at, at the auditorium. There are plaques for um, uh, I believe they're still there. Uh, World War One, World War Two, and Vietnam veterans. Uh, all all the folks that you know um, lost their lives in those conflicts. And uh, and as it as this. As a student at the high school, I, I took time to look at those. And these plaques, I, I think people would take time to look at them and read about their careers and read about their contributions, which is, um, that's a lot to get from something. And I, I think it's a, good, it's a good acknowledgement. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Director Fields. I think now, well, Dr. McGarry, sorry about that. Did you have a comment? No, you go first. Um, Mr. Rogers, can you just give like a, a ballpark of, I know you, you said that we, you pay per character on the plaque um, when that, you, t you said $1,000. Is that like the length of a tweet? Is it a sentence? Is it a um, paragraph? Like ha ballpark for that $1,000, what are we talking about? I'd say it's a, a medium-sized paragraph. A enough to really <clears throat> follow through on what, and truly honor these two individuals if you were to, to Write it up, and I I would not be taking on that task. That's not my area of expertise. Is uh, <laughs> writing something like that. The only thing that sticks in my head is that um, if we if we're considering both, but we're about to make a decision, right? If we vote on it, but the person who didn't want it to be both names, they may be willing to accept that if there's also going to be a plaque. Like if there's going to be a place where that person is distinguished and acknowledged alone, they may then say. I mean, they may say, okay, well, I'm okay with it being the Benglian, Beglian Dietzler Performing Arts Center with the understanding that there's also going to be a plaque that is exclusive to Harry and talks about his contribution and accomplishments. Again, I would want to know that <laughs> before I make this decision. You said there's time to... Can so, I... okay. I just have a quote. Dr. McGarry? I just want to make sure I, I, in my mind, Craig, what we're trying to accomplish tonight, um, five... Point five on page 
slide two, and, and Kyle, we're, tonight I think you're asking the, the board to s simply say you agree to change the name, and then you can come back and work through what that name change will be, potentially, and how to honor it, or is it simply, I want to make sure we're, we're, we're focusing on what it is. If it's tonight that they have to agree to how they're changing the name versus just that they're going to change the name, it's two different, two different points that we have to get through. <coughs> So your policy doesn't really envision having competing options here. Uh, so your, it, look, the policy is supposed to give your, it is supposed to be your way of establishing your procedures. And you have not established a procedure for this. So you're going to have to decide what it is that you want to do moving forward with this. Um, you certainly can decide at this point that all that you're doing is generically making a decision that you're open to changing the name and we'll have further discussions at a later point. That's fine. Uh, like I said, your policy doesn't really speak to it one way or the other. And there's no problem with doing that because in the end, there's no law that says that you must do this or that or any other way of doing it. I believe Director Neal also had a concern. Thank you, Kyle. That, that, that answer. Yeah, so my question, well, um, Kyle, I guess, spoke to this when he said we could um, generically decide to move forward a name change but not specify the name. Tonight, I, I was going to say, could we just table this item and consider it at next month's committee meeting? You can choose to do what you'd like. This is, you know, you are the governing body of this, of this district. Um, my point was only that you can decide now what you're intending to be doing in the process that you're going to be following because you have a situation that was not envisioned when this policy was put together. Director Mitchell. I just wanted to say, since I'm one of the requesters, I'm not going to weigh in now or when we vote on it. Um, but I do think it's really important to honor both of these individuals appropriately. Thank you, Director Mitchell. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Director Haig. So just to be totally clear, we're not voting tonight. So what we're looking for tonight is whether there are two people who say yes, let's, let's consider a name change at a future meeting. And the earliest that that meeting could be anyway is March because it, it's too late for the February meeting anyway, correct? Yes and no. Right. Well, sorry, I, I wasn't actually going to comment on that. I was, <laughs> um, I guess my point was only that if you, if you only had one name under consideration, and you were tonight deciding whether to move forward with a name change, then by default, you were also saying that is the name. That's just not where you are now. To Dr. Haig's point, if, they, if it's generically approved, you, can't, you, you still have time until March because you have to advertise for 14 days. So there's plenty of time before the March date to generically approve, work out the comments that are being here, and provide an update prior to the March board meeting. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Yeah, that, uh, that was, I had, I started raising my hand. That was what I was going to say, that the, the actual name that's going to be voted on has to appear in, in the newspaper of record prior to the vote. So it, it does have, you know, we have to set the name at some point. So how do we proceed with this next piece? We, someone needs to nominate, I mean, or just two people said, we agree that we're gonna do a name change. Um, and then we can figure out, the, it sounds like we're gonna figure out the specifics later, but we're just gonna agree to do a name change. Two people have to agree to that, is that correct, Kyle or Craig? Th that, that certainly can be your procedure at this point. There's your, your policy- I mean, according to what I'm reading, that's what it says. Your so. policy is ambiguous about whether or not the name change refers to a particular name or whether it refers to 
the process of a name change. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I don't have an opinion on which was intended here. I think that this, because of what was uh, expected, that there'd only be one name coming forward, the language here would then be read, read to mean the name that was suggested is then being approved to move forward. So Director Desnoyers may be correct that the, the requirement is to put into the newspaper the particular name that you're planning to, to move forward with, which would mean that you wouldn't advertise it now. You would advertise it after you've had other discussions so that you can then come back in, in time for the next, for the March meeting and advertise for two weeks. Okay. Director Mitchell. So if we were to get the answer to Mr. Brown's question prior to the February meeting, could we have the discussion under old business or no? We could, we, you could have the conversation at the February board meeting on their old business, and that would allow for the 14 days before the March meeting. Yes. Okay. Good conversations. Any other questions, concerns, comments? All right, I think we're at the time now where we just need two board members to agree to move this full, move this, Dr. McGarry? Yeah, I, would, I, I think I would wait until we get through the rest of the agenda, and then when we come back after public comments, the board will be able to make those decisions at, the, at that time. Understood. I think we are, are we ready to move on to the next agenda item? All right, agenda item number three, please. At this, so agenda item number three is policy, which will require board action. At this point, I'll hand it over to Director Desnoyers. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, there are three policies under consideration this evening, as Mr. Rogers previously said. They are policy 610, purchases subject to bid quotation, policy 611, purchases budgeted, and policy 626, federal fiscal compliance. Um, as a reminder, uh, these policies underwent a first reading at the January board meeting, and if moved forward tonight, still need a um, uh, need to be voted on uh, and adopted at a subsequent board meeting. Um, so the changes to the policies um, are simply changing the minimum dollar amounts um, f where the requirements for these various policies kick in. Um, and those changes are driven by statute. Uh, so they're not in the statute, but the statute says uh, the, the dollar amounts have to be updated each year to, to keep in line with uh, inflation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director DeSnoyers. Anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, I think we can move on to public comment. Am I correct? Right. Mrs. Buford, do we have anyone online who had submitted comments for the uh, at any of the agenda items this evening? Director Warsavage, there are no comments for this evening. Thank you so much. Is there anyone here presently physically who would like to make a public comment? Seeing none, I believe we can move forward with the review of the agenda before taking any necessary board action. The first agenda item, again, was the report on the annual water testing, which was informational. Mr. Marvin Lee provided an update on our water testing as it regarded, in regards to the copper and lead testing throughout the district. Uh, item number two was a request to name a school district facility as an update to the board, uh, which will require board action in the sense we will at this time need to discuss whether or not there are two board members that would like to move forward with the idea of renaming the facility, um, which would put us into this next phase and allow for time uh, for future discussion. All right, do we have two interested board members who would like to move this forward? President Brown and Director Desnoyers. Okay. The final item was policy, uh, which will require board action for policy 610, 611, and 626. 
The board would like to move those forward to a second reading? Yes. 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 That concludes our agenda for the evening. Thank you very much. I believe a motion for adjournment is in order. So moved. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Hi. Aye. Aye. All right, please uh, beg, bear with us for about five minutes until we transition into the next meeting. Thank you.
Welcome back to the Education and Pupil Services Committee in-person and virtual meeting for January 25th. The meeting of the Education and Pupil Services Committee will please come to order. The district posted this evening's agenda to board docs at least 24 hours prior to the commencement of this meeting. Is there a motion to approve that previously posted agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. The agenda has been moved and seconded. Are there any amendments to offer? No, Board no. President Brown. Thank you. The agenda has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye opposed and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carried. I will now turn over the Education and Pupil Services Committee agenda to co-chair uh, Ms. Williams. Mr. Neal's not here. Thank you. Mrs. Kelly, I'll let you begin with an overview of the agenda items for this evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight on the Education and Pupil Services Committee meeting, um, we have one agenda item, which is informational. Um, Dr. Manfrey and um, Mrs. Kelly Simone will um, be presenting uh, the high school schedule update. And again, this is an informational um, item. Um, Dr. Manfrey, would you like to begin with your presentation? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Good evening, members of the board, Upper Darby School District community. Thank you for allowing us to provide you with an update this evening on the Upper Darby High School schedule. As a reminder, I'd like to provide you with some background information regarding some of the reasons we changed the schedule from 20, for the 2021-2022 school year. Please keep in mind that the pandemic was not the reason for the change. However, the pandemic did accelerate our ability to provide more flexible learning opportunities for our students. As I preview the agenda for you this evening, I wanted to review responsibilities and ever-changing mandates that have increased since the early 2000s and that have continued to increase and change. The requirements for running a high school in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is an onerous task, and no one schedule will ever act as a panacea to all the challenges we faced. Here are just a few, here are just a few examples as you review the agenda on this slide. Student achievement and access to courses for all students has been a concern for the high school since the early 2000s under No Child Left Behind when the school was labeled as being in corrective action. We have lived through academic expectations, both federal and state, changing from a school report card to a school performance profile to the Future Ready Pennsylvania Index. The teacher evaluation system has also recently changed from Act 82 to Act 13. The high school is now responsible for collecting career artifacts, multiple pathways to graduation, state exams, student attendance, student attendance improvement plans, four and five year graduation rates, Act 158, industry-based credentials, as well as tracking post-secondary transition. High school is no longer simply about passing classes, student discipline and climate. High school discipline has been scrutinized for the last 10 years via reports and interpretations of reports by the ACLU, the Education Law Center, Office of Civil Rights, Civil Rights Data, and local media outlets. It is a balancing act involving the trauma our students face and bring with them to school, along with the right to have a safe and supportive learning environment for students and staff. We'll, we'll be touching on the sleep study this evening. Increased number of students in special education and in our English language development programs. Transportation. As you know, we are experiencing a national bus sh driver shortage and cost to implement the steep sleep study could cost millions of dollars. We'll touch on teacher coverages and the national teacher shortage and substitute teacher shortage. In fact, recent national articles indicate an increase in the total number of educators leaving the profession. We'll touch on student flexibility, students who are working to help families feel better working 
synchronously and asynchronously, students on medical homebound instruction, and numerous other student needs. We'll be touching on charter school competition, especially in the area of cyber charter schools, costing the district over $17 million a year. We'll be talking about food services. And Mrs. Simone will also be discussing staff and student input and some possible future considerations. Move on to the next slide. Student achievement. In 2015, the federal government passed the Every Student Succeeds Act in an attempt to provide more flexibility to public school districts. But the fact is, little has changed in terms of accountability. Federal and state governments have simply shifted accountability from a school report card to a school performance profile and now to the Future Ready Pennsylvania Index. In addition, the rules continue to change and shift as it relates to the teacher evaluation system. This year, the state implemented Act 13, which replaced Act 82. Of course, rolling out a new evaluation system can cause a lot of trepidation for our teaching staff, not to mention that it is being implement, implemented in the midst of a global pandemic. In the evaluation system, there are still accountability measures, including standardized testing scores. The Upper Darby High School, at the Upper Darby High School, we have been attempting to improve student achievement over several years. But as you can see, first marking period data indicate that 11% of the students at Upper Darby High School fail at least one subject in the first marking period. Mrs. Simone. Thank you, Dr. Manfrey, and good evening, everyone. As Dr. Manfrey mentioned, Pennsylvania Act 13 of 2020 revised the Act 82 Educator Effectiveness Process used to evaluate professional employees beginning this school year. Teachers are evaluated based on tenure status, whether or not they teach a keystone-triggered course in literature, biology, or algebra, teach a certain number of special education students, or occupy certifications as either non-teaching professional or classroom teachers. Teachers face challenges and meet the needs of their students regardless of disability, economic status, and most recently, the impact of the pandemic. The demand to close the achievement gap is heavy and our staff provides flexibility, academic support, and social emotional connection to tackle our students' academic and social deficits. Climate and culture. We have been working on climate and culture in the Upper Darby School District through a variety of ways and is addressed in our comprehensive plan as a measurable goal. The school district has adopted a global positive behavior intervention and support system at all levels of our organization. We have also adopted a trauma informed approach to building positive relationships with our students. Through our ongoing relationship with Neurologic, we have established a sustainability plan that includes a trauma leadership team in all of our schools. In addition, we have certified restorative practices teams at all of our buildings. And last but not least, we have youth courts at every level. This schedule at the high school allows for these initiatives to be implemented in meaningful ways. Mrs. Simone? Our schedule continues to allow for positive behavior intervention and supports, PBIS, including weekly tier one lessons. We present lessons to address social emotional learning, college and career awareness, safety, and meeting behavior expectations as part of our schedule during the flex period. Our tier two team meets to support targeted students in need of more intense intervention. Our partnership with Lakeside continues to grow. The team supports the demand for trauma-informed services for our students, collaborates with building level administration, lead teachers and staff by providing on-site coaching and training. Our team models restorative practices and provides ongoing support and professional development to staff and students. As an example of restorative discipline, students participate in our youth court program and select to be judged by their peers through a student facilitated process. Our current schedule provides additional time for students to connect with teachers academically and build relationships with them through our asynchronous component of the learning model. 
special education programming, and English learners. Generally speaking, the number of special education students changes periodically, but at present, there are approximately 700 special education students at Upper Darby High School. The number of English learners has been steadily increasing since the 2013-2014 school year, when there were 175 English learners at the high school and 785 English learners district-wide. Today, there are 406 English learners at Upper Darby High School and 1,507 district-wide. These increasing and changing numbers certainly have an impact on scheduling and resources and have been a consideration for us and will be as we plan for the future. Sleep study. Here we see a brief comparison between the previous schedule and the current schedule. First, the previous schedule had a 7.30 a.m. start time, which the Pennsylvania Sleep Study highlighted as not optimal for adolescents. The previous schedule called for an 81-minute block and offered very little flexibility. Finally, the previous schedule lacked flexibility as it pertains to homework or additional help. Mrs. Simone? In our current schedule, students do not participate in in-person or synchronous instruction until 9.45 a.m. in a block period for 60 minutes. The model allows for asynchronous support or front-loaded lessons for 21 minutes per class in addition to the in-person synchronous instruction. The current model is flexible, allowing students to complete the asynchronous work or front-loaded material the night before or morning of the subsequent lesson or class. Student schedules vary depending on club sport involvement, home responsibilities, academic demand, and employment outside of school. Transportation. On this slide, you see a comparison of the previous schedule to the current schedule. Clearly, the current schedule has benefited the school district in several ways. Previously, the 7.30 a.m. start time would have put us in a very difficult situation regarding transportation. With the national bus driver shortage at hand, we would not have been able to transport the high school students in time for a 7.30 a.m. start. Even if there was not a national bus driver shortage, I'd like to remind you that the estimated cost to meet the recommendations of the sleep study and provide transportation to students would have been between $950,000 and $3 million annually. I'll remind you to, uh, I'll direct you to the sleep study pre presentation by Assistant Superintendent Ed Marshallak on January 28th, 2020. The fact is this schedule has placed us ahead of the curve regarding the sleep study. Additionally, this schedule has reduced transportation costs and no additional local, local funds were used to cover the cost of the technology needed for the morning asynchronous instruction. The cost of technology is more sustainable than the cost of transportation. Next slide, please. Class co coverage has been an issue regardless of schedule models. However, in the previous schedule, our administration would start their day at around 6 a.m. to secure class coverage for the day. Teachers report at 7.10 a.m. and coverages begin at 7.30, which did not give much notice to teachers regarding coverage responsibilities. Coverage consisted of half a block, which was traditionally around 80 minutes, although administration provides split coverage per period block to allow for teacher preparation in both models, the amount of coverage time is less in the current model with 60-minute in-person synchronous instruction. Although staff contractually report at 7.10 a.m. in the current schedule for asynchronous support starting at 7.30, the administration now has time to provide adequate notice for coverage preparation since the in-person synchronous start time is 9.45 a.m. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> the schedule provides learning through our in-person, virtual synchronous, and virtual asynchronous instruction. We also offer a blended learning model with administrative approval. However, there is future consideration for a full blended learning model offering. We are preparing students for post-secondary education and workforce endeavors. More and more colleges and universities are offering online asynchronous learning models, and the business world has streamlined online communication and transactions to enhance performance and efficiency. We have improved communication, access, and flexible learning in the current schedule to help train and prepare our students to enter an ever-changing technology and online navigation world. Next slide, please. Charter school competition. It is no secret to this board or this community that we are consistently and constantly defending our taxpayers from charter schools, both in person and cyber charter schools. This schedule provides us the opportunity to give our students flexibility to be synchronous, asynchronous, and in person, or a blended approach of any three of those models, allowing us to compete with cyber charter schools. It has been widely discussed that the Upper Darby School District is experiencing a 16% increase in charter school as far as the budget. We hope this schedule will help us protect against further increases. As a reminder, currently we have approximately 2,300 students learning virtually, whether that be synchronously or asynchronously, district-wide. And as you know from our enrollment reports, we are responsible for 855 charter school students, approximately half of which are cyber charter school students. As part, uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Mayer. It's okay. <laughs> Stealing my thunder here. Know, food services. As you can see, this slide offers a comparison of our food services program from the previous schedule to the current schedule. While the previous schedule offered students the opportunity to choose from a larger variety of items, it also placed 1,000 students in the cafeteria four times a day. This required a large amount of staffing as well as significant student management concerns. Our lead teachers and assistant principals were deployed to the cafeteria in the previous schedule and now they have been freed up to provide trauma support and be in the classrooms to provide proactive strategies to our teaching staff and to be instructional leaders. There are some changes that Principal Simone will talk about that will help the food quality in this schedule. As part of the revised schedule change, we changed the food service delivery by removing multiple lunch periods in the cafeteria to accommodate late start in the morning. We created food stations around the building during the flex lunch period at the beginning of the school year. Students could pick up their lunch from a food station on their way to their flex period. Based on conversations with targeted staff groups, discussion with Aramark, and student input, we adjusted food delivery and removed the food stations from the hallway. Students now go directly to their assigned flex period where lunch is delivered. The change has been well received by students and staff and there is less idle time in the hallways. Aramark has reported supply chain issues. Shortages in breakfast items cause a limited variety of entrees to be offered. For lunch, chicken continues to have determinate varieties which cause some menu changes in December. They said most Pennsylvania districts are reporting similar concerns. We have received feedback about the quality and quantity of food and are addressing the concerns. The high school student advisory, which is, was about 20 students, and I met with Ms. Elgart and Aramark Management on January 5th to share concerns about the food served at the high school. The students were honest and described menu items they did not like, concerns about the repetition of meal items, meals not at the desired temperature due to packaging, and portion size. To address their concerns, Ms. Elgart and the Aramark team did a food tasting with students on Wednesday, January 12th. Aramark brought 14 new items to try in new packaging that keeps food hot, 
similar to Wawa and Chick-fil-A containers. The food was placed in the same bags used for delivery during the flex period and was intentionally loaded with the items long ahead of the meeting to mirror the same time frame as students would receive meals during flex. After the tasting, the students were given to-go bags and offered the opportunity to take extra meals home, and most of them left with full bags, a good sign that they enjoyed the options. We also gave the items to sports teams practicing that afternoon, and we received feedback that they also liked the items, in particular, the eggplant parm sandwich. As far as portion size, food service is now serving breakfast and lunch during flex period. This gives students options to eat some or all of both meals during the time or take the breakfast home for the next day. The students love this idea and it started this past Monday. We meet with targeted staff groups regularly and the high school schedule is a consistent topic of discussion and I've outlined the groups as you can see here. The targeted groups completed a survey which required staff to select from the following options, keeping the schedule, keeping the schedule with minor adjustments, or restoring the old schedule. We have also discussed the recommended adjustments that staff feel would be beneficial. Around 74% of the targeted group members, which is 15 unique staff members since there are some staff members that are on multiple targeted groups, agreed to keep the schedule or keep the schedule with minor adjustments. We then surveyed the entire staff, and the results are comparable to the targeted group response. Around 70% of the remaining staff agreed to keep the schedule or keep the schedule with minor adjustments. And I will share future considerations at the end of this presentation. I meet with the student advisory every Wednesday, and again, the new high school schedule is a consistent agenda item. We have discussed food service delivery in terms of quality and quantity, and students have expressed concerns that we reviewed earlier in this presentation. We also discussed ways to utilize the cafeteria in the future by possibly creating a cafe option that allows for controlled use with some rotation so students have the cafe experience, but not in the traditional four period schedule as before. Students expressed the benefits of the late start and asynchronous component of the schedule, the advanced placement program, instructional delivery, and students balancing their workload with the flex period are also regularly discussed. Students have expressed an interest in more instructional time in the AP program. As previously stated, we are exploring the creative use of the cafeteria as a possible cafe style offering. We are exploring the possibility of a full year AP course as a double block period. However, we have to consider the impact on staffing and other elective areas. We have considered this, especially since it is a favorable option according to the staff and students currently in the AP program this school year. Still again, we have to conduct a data analysis of the impact on course offerings and staffing. We are also looking to adjust the flex period and possibly change breakfast delivery with an additional homeroom period. Dr. Manfrey? Sorry. In addition, uh, through the use of ARP and ESSER funds, we will be attempting to bring a uh, scheduling consultant to work with the Upper Darby High School scheduler um, beginning uh, in late February, early March. That concludes our presentation with one, one point of clarity. Um, if we go back to the special education programming and English learners slide, I mentioned the number 700 students at Upper Darby High School. This slide is in reference to district-wide numbers, 2,391 special education students district-wide. But since we were uh, speaking about uh, Upper Darby High School, I mentioned approximately 700 at Upper Darby High School. Point of clarity. Oh, OK, thank you. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Um,
co-chair Williams, if I make a point of personal uh, inquiry. Um, I, Board Secretary Rogers, I just want to record my presence here in the, the meeting at, uh, I believe it was 651 when I sat down. Okay, thank you. Do we have any comments or questions from the board? Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, question for uh, Ms. Simone. You mentioned doing, uh, I think you meet with your student advisory every Wednesday, um, and they, you said they were um, in favor of the late start, right? Did anyone have any, um, were in, did anyone have any negative comments on it, or was anyone not in favor of the late start? Just curious. Sure. Um, the majority of the students were in favor. Um, we did have some discussion on um, the impact that it has and trying to navigate the asynchronous work um, and coming in late. Um, but the majority of the student advisory were in favor of uh, the late start time. Okay. Thank you. Director Mitchell. Thank you for this presentation. I know with change, there's always some hiccups. So, um, I have seen a little talk and buzz about students still being late to school, not making it in time. What, what's the impact on that and how is that going? Sure. Yes, students are still late to school, believe it or not. Um, we are, we are uh, monitoring that. We have actually adjusted our entry plan um, a couple times. Um, right now we seem to be using um, a method that is, is working pretty effectively. Um, so I'll be able to give you more feedback at another time. But yes, uh, there's, no, uh, th there's no secrets. It, students are still late, um, and, and we are looking into how we can uh, you know, address that. Have we looked at at all um, uh, you know, to find out, is it a transportation issue that students are like? Because a lot of students are considered walkers here. So I'm just wondering, uh, like, have we really looked at why they're still late? Mrs. Mitchell, when students are, are late to school, uh, I believe that the assistant principals and or the lead teachers along with the counselors work with them to put a plan in place individually for how that may be rectified. Um, so to, to speak in general terms about that would be very difficult. Uh, also, uh, student lateness is addressed for a, a student who may be chronically late through a student attendance improvement plan. That, that goes along with not just absences, but also latenesses. So it would be difficult to general, make a general statement about why students are being late. I guess what I'm really asking is, are we seeing more lateness than we did with the original schedule? Or less, or about the same? Um, I mean, I, I don't want to be exact, um, but you know, we do target students through our tier two process as well, similar to what we were doing before the schedule change. Um, lateness and absenteeism is no different. Um, we, we had those concerns prior to the schedule change, um, and we are addressing them, as Dr. Manfrey said, through our SAPE and through our tier two targeted groups, um, similar to what we've done prior to this new schedule. Thank you. We have any further questions? Yeah, I'm sorry, I just thought of one more if I can. Please. Um, the asynchronous that we have in the morning that's flexible that students can take advantage of before the in-person starts. Do we have um, any way to quantify that? Like how many students are taking advantage of that? Um, just just want to get a feel for how many, you know, that's a nice option, but I'm just curious to know how many take advantage of it. Um, we are having teachers track that information. Um, they are working with students. Um, some classrooms are seeing a higher percentage of engagement than others. Um, and there are certain weeks that we have a higher percentage than others. So we are tracking that information. Um, I can you know, provide exact week to week if that's something that we would need to do. We do have that information, um, but we are addressing specific content, specific teachers, um, and we're working with those teachers um, depending on if they're getting a high engagement or, or not. Okay, yeah, I don't want a week to week. I was just curious to know, like, overall themes and things like that, if, if they're taking advantage of it. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Brown, if I may, one, one of the things I think is important to remember as a staff here at Upper Darby High School is that that asynchronous time, although it is flexible in terms of when you log on and, and prepare for the class, whether it's at night or the, or the morning of, is part of the class. 
And so we're working with our staff and our students to make sure that they understand the importance of that asynchronous time. To be honest, we have some work to do in that area. Uh, as Mrs. Mitchell indicated, there, with a the new schedule, there's going to be hiccups and this asynchronous stuff, although it's been going on for 22 months, is relatively new to our students and our staff. And I feel confident that, that we'll be able to work through that. But we do have uh, improvement in that area that's needed, for sure. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Director Desnoyers. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would like to um, thank all involved in this project for their hard work. Um, I'm very pleased to hear a, a significant number of positives uh, come out of this project, and I um, and I really appreciate um, Principal Simone and Dr. Mann for your informative presentation. Thank you. Director Hay. Thanks, Director Williams. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, first of all, is there a plan to do a full student survey? I know you saw you gave us the full staff survey and the student advisory, but is, will there be a full student survey? Um, yes, we plan to look at that for year-end data. Great. Um, and then the the um, second question was: Are are how are teachers feeling about being able to keep up? Like, I, I, so you spoke to this a little bit, Dr. Manfrey, as far as you know having some, some growing pains and, and working with staff on making use of that instructional time. I'm just wondering if you're hearing much about, oh, I'm so behind because I'm not able to cover as much. Are you talking in terms of uh, balancing synchronous instruction and in-person instruction or asynchronous instruction with uh, in-person instruction? Really any of the above. I mean, I can, under, I can imagine that from content area to content area or even from teacher to teacher, it might vary how you sort of manage that chunk of time. I mean, as, as someone who teaches and right. also suddenly switched virtual and actually only just Monday went back to the classroom for the first time in almost two years, um, you know, I, 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 can, I can envision different people managing it different ways, but in the, in the end of the year, we want them to still be, you know, hitting the material that we were, you know, were hitting before. This is anecdotal at best, but I've spoken to some teachers at Upper Darby High School who seem to be managing the asynchronous and in-person part of the schedule very well. Um, what they're doing is planning the asynchronous instruction as part of their, their, their lesson, their daily lesson. Mm -hmm. And the in-person instruction uh, just flows naturally from the asynchronous instruction. Mm -hmm. Is there work yet to be done in terms of training and professional development? Yes. But I think Upper Darby School District is ahead of the curve in, 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 that, in that regard. I know Dr. Mayor, uh, Dr. McGarry would like to comment on that as well. I just wanted to follow up, I guess, to understand the question a little bit uh, as well. Um, your question was covering curriculum. Mm -hmm. I think it's, again, a reminder, one of the unique parts uh, about high school scheduling, especially in the county, is you know, there is no set number of minutes in the county or in the Commonwealth that says how many minutes per class meaning you could be a 40, like my son's in a 41 minute period. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, Upper Darby School District is giving 81, 60, and 21 still for the, full, for the semester, as opposed to a 41 minute class in other surrounding districts. In some ways, our kids have been getting historically more instructional time in the curriculum. And what originally the argument was under the block schedule was um, how can teachers sustain 81 minutes of instruction in the block? Um, I forwarded some information to Christine Kelly today. Penn is actually coming out and providing uh, professional development even more so. We're going to look into for teachers on balancing the instructional models because it seems to be catching on more and more, mm -hmm. good, bad, or indifferent, depending on how you see that. Um, but again, I think it's important to note on the slide that there's 60 and 21 minutes. It's still 81 minutes in, of instruction. And I do think breaking this up is the, as you know, as a teacher, allowing the chunking of the course to be appropriate versus someone lecturing for 80 straight minutes. Um, this allows to front load and break up those, those courses that way. We have heard to Board President Brown's question about, you know, do kids feel okay with the late start or not? We hear from most AP students um, who feel like not the start time, but they would prefer the full course all year. Um, that was something that came up previously that continues to come up for that population of students. My argument back to 
Ms. Uh, Simone, Ms. Kelly, and Dr. Manfrey is our students are essentially getting more instructional time in AP classes than neighboring school districts are getting a 41-minute period of time. Our kids are getting above and beyond that. Perhaps there's a before high school issue that we have to address to prepare them better for that moment because the amount of time is greater here than it is in other places. Um, it, so that's a conversation that we need to talk about um, as we go forward with it. Are you saying, I'm sorry, I just want to get clarification. You're saying they get more time in the new schedule than neighboring districts or before? Our students in, in the current schedule are still getting that 60 and the 21. In surrounding school districts, they're getting a 41 minute if they're not in a block schedule. So we're still giving more time. And then we have additional flex time in the schedule that they're getting. So they are getting additional support. Um, I think there's a consistency and a safety that students that are high achieving want to have. They want to keep pushing themselves in that, in that area. And I think Mrs. Simone has figured out a solution even to address that issue going into next school year with the schedule. But they seem to be the top concerns and the co top con uh, complaints. Food that I hear about and the AP courses um, from the nervousness of those students. And we're trying to make, you know, make that fit along with the other adjustments uh, that we have to, we have to make. I, I don't doubt for a moment that, that it's, it's workable to still be doing the same amount of material that you were doing before, but I guess what I was asking too, and, and I understand that this is sort of a, a bigger question than can maybe be answered right now, is, is how, are, how are teachers managing the transition to this, to this newer, newer setup? And, and, and certainly our students are getting, are, are getting a great amount of time in that block, but then it is only half a year. So I, this is something, it's been, it's been acknowledged, you're working on it, it sounds great, let's, let's, let's work on it. Um, the other question that I had was you, you, you talked about a, a flex period adjustment and, and a homeroom adjustment. Can you just say a little bit more about like what, what is under consideration for those? Uh, sure. There's been feedback from advisory and in particular the high school action research um, uh, members and uh, some of the suggestions included possibly taking some minutes off of flex and adding a homeroom period for a breakfast. Um, and then we also talked about moving the flex within the day in a different part of the day um, to satisfy different needs that we're seeing. Um, so they're the two um, areas that we're referring to. Thanks. I would, uh, you have, no, you I, I would like to, to mention some, uh, some data that was not included in this presentation because uh, I didn't have it until today when I was meeting with Melissa Figueroa Douglas and, and the two middle school principals regarding disproportionality and some discipline data that we were examining. I'm, I'm happy to report that at, at, as of January 18th, uh, we had a, only 132 incidents at Upper Darby High School that resulted in suspension. Now, that might sound like a lot, but just to add some, some uh, relativity to it, 27-2018, we had 1,000, this is full year data, 1,238 incidents that resulted in suspension. In 2018-2019, we had 1,095 incidents that re resulted in suspension. And in 2019-2020, we had 768 incidents that resulted in suspension. So in terms of being on pace, we are well below. Uh, now we have the spring coming up, um, and sometimes behavioral incidents increase in the spring, but only 132 incidents resulting in suspensions as of January 18th is pretty, pretty good. Now I can't attribute all of that to the high school schedule, but certainly I think the high school schedule has a piece of that. I, I just, I just wanted to circle back because I think Dr. Hagen and I are similar sometimes. I get stuck when I, when I, I want to understand some of these pieces. So, because <laughs> this is important um, from a scheduling standpoint to, to Board President Brown's question. A AP students historically, right, they're still getting access and support for their AP courses all year at the high school in that flex period, correct? That's correct. Right. So, this, so currently, when you said it's only a half a year of support. But the flex is They're, they're getting, they're, okay, so, it, I, I, it's, it's so go they ahead. get, so how it works is whatever semester they have the block instruction, they get the flex support in the opposite semester. How is that similar previously where there wasn't also a full year of the AP course? For it's, the 80 minutes. It is similar to the old schedule where it would, we called them the skinnies and it was wrapped around lunch. Now it's within the flex. So it's the same concept, um, just it's through the flex and not the old skinny. 
Yeah, I just want to make sure, you know, anybody who's, who's listening that th there wasn't a full year of 80-minute uh, courses, but now we're proposing potentially a full year 60-minute AP course. Yes, so the proposal is full year 60-minute, 21-minute asynchronous portion on both semesters. You also have to remember right now you, you only get the asynchronous portion in the semester of your block, not the semester of your flex. If that makes sense. And I know that Mr. Simone did talk about implications of doing something like that, but you have to understand that when we're talking about 388 advanced placement students, that's about 15 sections of other electives that they will not be eligible to take. So you're taking elective opportunities essentially away from advanced placement students, and they may be okay with that. However, that leaves some elective teachers with possibly, possibly, without sections of students to teach with that number of students being in a full year AP course. So th those are things that we have to work through. I, my, my only concern with that, and that's why I wanted to come back to that conversation is, and I, I want to reiterate this, we're coming out of a pandemic. We obviously know that we were doing work prior to the pandemic. Compliments to you, Kelly, uh, Ed Marshallak, Chris, I know Chris is back there, the PBIS, the um, the work on trauma, the work that you've done at the high school, I think it's a combination of your efforts at the high school and the scheduling that has really turned things around. So I want to make sure that you're aware that we appreciate all of you, what you guys have done, putting these programs in place. It takes time to get those discipline uh, incidents down. I have expressed this to you, Kelly and Greg and Christine. You know, I struggle with, I've been guilty of this 10 years ago in a public presentation that adding more time essentially is the cure-all to an instructional issue. And it's not necessarily that you just increase the instructional time and you're going to solve the problem. I still think that there's areas where we have to improve prior to getting to the high school and that there, we're holding on to this time, 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 time in some situations. And now, as you just explained, now we're going to go for that whole period of time with 60 minutes, and that now means it's another choice, which means there's going to be 25 different phone calls that will come for the, from another choice. And as you did a great job, Greg, of explaining early on, there's no one cure-all for this. And I want to make sure that we're smart about making these decisions and not fixing the problem where it may exist. Preparation to be successful in the moment comes prior to sometimes coming into the game. And it doesn't have to just be in the moment. You can grow in that moment, but there's prep that's getting there. My concern is we still have to do a better job at the elementary schools. We still have to do a better job at the middle schools. That allows kids to shine. If surrounding school districts can compete in a 41-minute period of time, now, mind you, they're also not getting nearly the number of electives that we're offering, I would hate to see us make some decisions and then block out some other opportunities because high school, as I've, I've said many times, is not a terminal degree. It's just the launch pad to get you to a different place. So I think we need to keep that in mind. I, I know, Kelly, you've been going crazy to meet the needs of those students and those parents that are reaching out to you about that issue, I definitely think that's something to consider as well moving forward. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys have all brought that up as a conversation. You're trying to solve, as you explained tonight, an unbelievable puzzle with thousands of pieces. And, and I appreciate the time and effort that went into this presentation and what you're trying to solve. And, and it's, there's no one solution to this. I agree with Mr. Desnoyers. I pre appreciate the information. Any other board members have comments? Any members of the public have comments? There are no comments for, for this evening. We can review the agenda. So our only item tonight was, of course, um, the high school scheduling update that was informational for this evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Director Williams. A motion is in order for the adjournment of the Education and People Services Committee meeting. Second. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Have a good night, everyone.